South Hills, I wanna let you in behind the scenes and give you some insight with the budget that we set for 2022. Now, I know many of you are sitting in a campus that's probably been in existence for two years, five years, maybe seven years, but the reality is, is our church has been in existence for 24 years. So we've had a lot of history, a lot of story, a lot of experience with setting church budgets. So in 2022, our budget was set for $4,611,625. Year to date, where we're at today, $2,607,201. So for October, November, and December, we are short $2,004,424. Now, in the past, you've seen me stand here in the month of December and tell you where we're at and what is the gap that we would need to close. And today what I'm doing is I wanna make sure I bring that number to your attention sooner because I know that many people are operating out of fear with what's been happening in our economy, with the inflation, with gas prices going up. And what I wanna do is I wanna make sure that we're putting our trust in God. For the last couple of weeks, you've heard me stand up here and give the 90 day challenge. The 90 day challenge is an opportunity for those that have not taken a step towards trusting God with their finances to move in that direction. Step one, being obedient and trusting God with with a tithe, which is the first tenth of your income. The next step would be going above and beyond and doing an offering above your tithe, which is above and beyond. And then step number three, which was the step I shared with you last week that my family and I are taking, which is increasing our tithe and increasing our above and beyond. When I see the numbers that we're facing right now, I don't look at this as a number problem. I've been in ministry way too long. What I see is an opportunity for God to transform lives, for God to bless lives, my life, your life. And as we step out in faith and trust God and put our faith in God. So South Hills, I just wanted to take a moment today and ask you to take this step to have your life transformed. Well, welcome to South Hills, Manhattan Beach. Um, this is family month. And uh, I, I know that it, when you look outside and you look around, there's tons of kids usually running around. It feels like there's a lot of families here. But I also know that there's many here that maybe you're here alone. Maybe you don't have a family. Maybe you say, hey, man, it's just me. My family either you know, lives out of town or I, I'm the only one left. Whatever it may be, listen. We have our families in our homes, we have our biological families, and we have this family here. So if you don't have a family, you are a part of this family, and you are welcome to join us. So, and that, there's no, there's no requirement there other than uh, be a little kind, okay? If you're part of this family, we try to be as kind as possible. Uh, today, um, the, the topic that we're going to go through today is be a family on a mission. And I got to ask a question. And, I, and this doesn't just pertain to our families. I think this just pertains to us in general. Does anybody in here feel like you're genuinely on a mission? Like you have a mission in life. I'm going to accomplish this, and this is what I'm going to do. I bet some of us have it in our careers. I bet some of us have it in different areas of life where we go, you know what? I'm really good at keeping track of this. And so I keep focused here, and I'm like, I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm always ready to go when it comes to this area. But there's probably others where you're like, ah. That's not important to me. I don't know. I just don't, I don't pick up on that one. But I'd be willing to bet that many of us in here are just making it, are just getting through the days, get, just getting through the weeks, the years. We don't have a real plan. We might have a financial plan or we might have a physical plan that we work towards for health or whatever it might be, but do we really have a mission? Would you say, I'm a man on a mission or a woman on a mission? Like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to accomplish. I don't know. I think that many of us, and I, I, got, I got to be honest with you, I don't know. I struggle with it personally. I try to get our family on a mission. Is like, yes, as a church we have a mission, but as a family I might struggle with it. Did you know that South Hills Church has a mission, and it's not a new one. It's been around since 1998. It's to lead unchurched people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't know, it's pretty simple. I didn't make it up. 
I didn't think of it. It's been around since 1998. I was, Chris Songson, the founding pastor of South Hills, was my youth pastor. And so through the 90s, I knew him really well. He worked on staff with my dad at a church. And then when he started South Hills in 98, I didn't join the church, get a part of what was happening until about 2006 or so. And then we were here for a while. And then we left to go to Nashville for a while. Now we're back. And so I've been a part of this vision for a long time. I've, I've experienced South Hills vision and I've known what they've been about for a long, long time. And it's never changed. It is truly to lead the unchurched into a growing relationship with Jesus. That takes all of us. That's not just about those who maybe have never been to church. That's about each and every one of us. We're a family, right? And if we're a family, it takes every part of the body to complete a mission. There's another statement you might see, and that is the perfect place for imperfect people. But that's not a mission statement. That's a motto. That's more of a motto that we would try to live by. And we would try to make sure that people would know that, hey, listen, if you're looking for perfection, <laughs> it's the wrong place. All of us are imperfect. We're all still learning. We're all struggling in our own way. Some of us are doing real good at it, have little hiccups here and there. Some of us are having a hard time. But we're a family, and we're going to get through it together. The mission of South Hills, the church itself, is simply a reflection of the Great Commission. Matthew 28 said, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now that phrase, the Great Commission, is not technically a biblical term. However, it was Jesus commissioned to his disciples after he rose from the grave and before he went back to heaven, before he ascended to heaven. It was his mission that he said, all, go into the world, preach the good news, preach the gospel, make disciples, baptize them. I know that many of us in here would be like, <laughs> like, I don't know if I'm going to do that, man. Like, I'm, I'm probably not going to be out there making disciples and baptizing people and all of that. Like, I'm just not sure if that's me. I don't know if that's my gifting. Like, I got other things in life, right? But that's okay. There's different ways about that. See, I might be the one who God has placed here on this little stage, and I get to share what he puts on my heart. And maybe some of you get to do that in other capacity, but some of you are like, hey man, I don't love to speak. Like, I, I'm not that guy. I'm not that girl. I'm more behind the scenes. Well, then going into the world and showing the gospel and showing the good news might also be a good way to make disciples. See, because when people see Jesus in you, then they're gonna go, hey, what, what is it that's just a little bit different about you? Where'd you get that joy? Like, how come you're happy more often than not? How come you get through your struggles when some of us seem to never get through them? And some of you in this room are saying, yeah, well, I'm still a Christian and I seem to never get past this struggle. Well, Paul had a thorn in his flesh. We don't know what that was, but we all got things that we deal with. But when we reflect Jesus, when we do our best to be on the mission that he's called us to, maybe you don't have to preach. Maybe you don't have to go out there and tell stories or talk about what the Bible says. Maybe you could just live it out. Maybe you're just that person that people go, I want to know what you got. And before you know it, they go, hey, how come? And you go, uh, you know, and you don't have to give them some great grandiose scripture of like, well, you know, Matthew 28 says. I mean, you can just say, hey, you know what? I, I don't know. I, I, I got to tell you, I... I believe and trust in God. And I can't explain why, but it just is. And if that sounds crazy to you, come visit at my church sometime. Come visit us sometime. I promise you, there's no pressure. Just come, hang out. Find the community. Find the family. They'll find what's in you. That's a way to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. That's a way to go and make disciples. And that's the mission of South Hills Church. It's the mission of us here. Make disciples, baptize them, 
Bring them closer to me. That's all Jesus is asking. Bring them closer to me. Is it truly the mission of the church? Is it truly the mission of us as followers of Christ? Is it truly the mission of those who would call themselves Christians to make disciples? James 4 says, to him who knows good and does not do it, to him it is a sin. That's a hard one. It's kind of like, oh man, I knew better, right? How many times have you heard that? Ah, uh, you know better than to do that. How many times have you said, he knows better than to do that, she knows better than to do that. I know better than to do that. I think we do hold ourselves to those standards sometimes, and that's why we kind of inflict it on others. That statement is a pretty common one, but if we really think about it and we think about what that means, to say that to them who knows good and doesn't do it, that's where we get tripped up. That's where we run into problems. See, once you have the mission and know the mission, it's go time. It's time to go. Now we got a job to do. You got to make a plan. And as I was saying earlier, I have to admit to you, my family has always worked on having a plan. I mean, do we have a plan? Look, our lives is pretty much engulfed in this place. I mean, this is who we are. South Hills Church is who we are. It's where God has placed us and he's called us as a family. Not just me. Not just me and my wife who's usually out here doing most of the cooking. And, and now that Jill and Sandy have jumped in, and we've got a few more that obviously our cookers are in here too as well. But, uh, <laughs> but we've got a few that are helping her now. And so she might be able to hang out a little bit more. But I mean, this is, this is who we are. We love this. We love to be a part of this. Sometimes the kids don't love it. Sometimes the kids get the brunt of the busyness. Sometimes the kids get the brunt of the tiredness or maybe a little bit of the stress sometimes. And so us as a family, we've been working on it for a while to really get together and make a family mission, make a family plan. And I have to admit to you that I have been terrible at it. About a week and a half ago, my son, he's 13, he says to me, he says, uh, he said something about, we, we were talking about, you know, move in and what that means. And I said, man, we got to, we really got to work on some things, this area, this area, Jack. And, and uh, I said, we, we need to have a family meeting. And I said it to him, but then I said it to my wife, I said it to Ann, and we were talking about it, and we said, okay, tomorrow night we're having a family meeting. Well, that family meeting didn't happen, because we got busy, and then we said, okay, well, let's have it the next night. You know, Jack asked me for three days, are we having a family meeting? Which kind of blew me away, because I've said it before in the past, and he's never cared, but this time it was like he really cared, and I thought, you know what, there has to be a reason why he cares right now. There has to be something going on that it's in him to keep on his dad about having a family meeting. And I have to believe that this might have something to do with it. That we're in this season right now as a family with our families as well. I don't think I'm the only one. I think there's many in this room. I was talking to a few families and before first service of those with family members struggling. And I know that there's plenty in this room who, maybe it's you, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's just, man, we're having a hard time right now. Well, God knew it was coming. So we're in family month. <laughs> God knew exactly what was coming. So he said, hey, I got family month for you. Let me share some things with you. Today, I commit to you. I ask you, keep me accountable. Ask me, how's your family doing? How's your family meetings? everything good? You can ask me that. There ain't nothing wrong with asking me that, please. And I hope the same for you. So we're going to dive in today and we're going to see what God has for us. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, I thank you for each and every person here, Lord, single, family, married, no matter what, God. We're a part of your family. And I pray, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing to you, Lord. I pray that every word that we hear today is divinely inspired by you. That it wouldn't be opinion, advice, or anything but encouragement from your word. 
I thank you for each and every person here. Lord, I pray that you bless every home represented. Speak to us, challenge us. Yes, change us. And if at times convict us, Lord, but most of all, encourage us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, well, we're gonna open up the Bible. And if you don't have one, don't worry about it. We'll have it on the screens. But Colossians chapter three, don't feel out of place. Look, mine just sits here. How come I don't use that, huh? Well, it's because of these. I can't read anything. Every time I do this, I can barely read the little letters, so I just keep it on my notes. But you guys got it here. Some of you got Bibles, and I'm super proud of you. Uh, Colossians chapter 3. This is uh, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, and I was talking to somebody at, uh, who helps with our men's Bible study stuff, and he said, man, that's funny because I had to memorize that when I was going through a mentorship years ago. Colossians chapter three. This chapter embodies many, if not almost all of the foundations of the Christian walk. It encourages, it solidifies, it convicts and challenges, it's soft and strong at the same time, and it's also hard and yet simple to understand. It follows up what Paul wrote in the previous chapter, and that is that you no longer belong to this world, but you are now in Christ. You are have a mission. And we're going to read most of this chapter, but we'll break it up and make sense of it as we go. So let's start Colossians chapter three, verse one through 17. I think this is the first few verses here, but it says this, therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. So you can imagine, first off, if you've been here at at all with me personally, you can imagine that I love this first portion. It says, "Set set your mind on things that are above. Keep your focus on that. Keep your focus on the good. Keep your focus on what God has and what is heavenly, not on the destruction that is earthly, not on the division that is earthly, not on all of the things that we're struggling with here and now because God says, heaven on earth. He says, that which is in heaven be here on earth. And I have to admit as well that if I think on the problems, I don't know if any's like me, but if I think on the problems around me, I get overwhelmed. Because I happen to be, uh, I don't know if I'm good at it, but I happen to be a fixer in my mind. I'm not sure I can fix a lot of things, but I happen to think I can. So I'm always thinking, I got to fix it. If something's wrong, I got to fix it. Maybe it's the little bit of OCD in me that's like, oh yeah, this has to be straightened a few more times there, you know. Uh, And sometimes I do that. I would never want you to do that. I would never inflict somebody, that on somebody else. But for me, in my mind, when I focus on problems, when I focus on the things in my life that are negative, the things that we're struggling with, they're huge. Those things are bigger than anything else in life. And I can't stop thinking about it. My mind's already going a million miles a minute. So if it's the stresses and the trials and the struggles and all the things that I'm dealing with that goes in here constantly, I don't think about anything but those things. I don't know if any of you out there are like me, but I'd like to think that from conversations, more of us than not kind of feel that way, especially in the world that we're in today. Because we're in a world that doesn't just see things. We got to say something, right? We got to do something now. Even if it's not the right thing, we're going to say it or we're going to do it because somebody's got to do something, right? I might be able to control me and some of the things around me, but what happens when I can't? What happens when we can't? What do we do with those problems? What do we do with those things in our life that we're dealing with as families, with our loved ones, the ones we care about most? What happens when we can't control them? What happens when everything we've tried doesn't work? It consumes us or we ignore it. We shelf it. We put it away. We say, eh, forget about it. Now, don't hear me wrong in this. God says, think on the things of heaven. Now, heaven is without problems, without troubles, without pain and heartache and grieving. And it is with all the goodness of God. To think on the goodness of God does not ignore the problems. It gives weight to the hope instead of the fear. 
God doesn't say, think on things that are up here. Think on things that are in heaven. He doesn't say, think on those things just so that you can ignore all the stuff that's around you. He says, think on these things because the more that you do, the more you'll add weight to the hope that I give you. And those things, as we say so often, will grow strangely dim. Keep your eyes on him and they'll grow strangely dim. Huh. Most, and most of what we say about the problems around us, what, what do we say usually? Well, if we don't do something, then, well, if I don't, then, well, what happens if we don't fix it? If I gave you a problem to solve, and let's say it was, uh, here, this will make sense. Let's say Henry, Henry's a, a, a boy's name that uh, I kind of like. Hint, hint. Henry has a golf cart and two of the batteries died. It takes six batteries to run Henry's golf cart. How many batteries does Henry need to get his golf cart back up and running? What's the answer? Well, us parents were like, oh, I know this. I got to do this all the time. I got a kid that comes up to me every night with some different question. It's like, I don't know the answer to this. And so you go, oh, these are two batteries. Take six batteries. Uh, these are two batteries, right? So it's trick questions. I don't know what this is. It's not. Well, man, what about the other four? What do we do about those? Some of us would answer that though, right? Like you got to replace a couple batteries, and you're like, what about the other four though? Well, that's not the problem right now. Like the two, fix the two, right? Replace the two. Or those batteries ain't cheap. Maybe Henry should just toss that piece of junk, right? That's not the answer. Okay, maybe that's drastic, but what about, oh my, those are heavy batteries. How am I going to get those replaced? I can't put those in. See, the question was simple, had a simple answer, but rarely do we focus on the answer. We just naturally focus on the problem even when we have the answer. We dive so much into all of the variables that could be, all of the things that might be, even if we have the answer, just sit with us. And I just believe, and bear with me on this, I believe that God is saying, think on these things, and I'll take care of those. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added. Before that verse, he says, don't worry about things. Don't worry about what you have, what you need, all that. Seek first the kingdom. All these things shall be added. Constantly in the Bible, you'll find scripture that says, Focus on me. Focus on the promises that I've given you. Focus on the blessings that are possible that I say are heavenly. And I promise you I'll take care of those things. Take my yoke. It's easy. Is there a problem? Yes. Is there an answer? Absolutely. Let's keep reading. Therefore, treat the parts of your earthly body now follow on this, as dead <laughs> to sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. And in them, you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also rid yourselves of all of them, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you stripped off the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created it in a, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. Let's stop there for a second. First of all, I know that's a, that's a tough little portion of scripture because it dives right into the sins. It dives right into the, to the deep stuff where you're like, all right, man, now I'm only hearing the things that I'm dealing with right now, you know? Now that's all I can think about is the problems that you just read, is all the evil things that you just said. And that's exactly what the enemy would love us to do. Focus on the things that we might be struggling with. But he says there, Put on the new self, which is being renewed. It's not an instant like that. It's not like a, oh, great, I'm saved. I'm good. I got Jesus. Everything is better, and I'm better. I don't do anything wrong now. It puts us in a place where we're actually willing 
to allow God to work on the things in us. What does that mean? That times he's going to challenge us. That times we're going to be walking through the street somewhere uh, on our way to a destination and a conversation with somebody will pop up and you'll be like, wow, I was just thinking about something like this. And all of a sudden I'm in this conversation. And it was like, I think it was, this was a crazy coincidence, right? Well, maybe it was a crazy coincidence, but I happen to believe that God knows what we're dealing with and we're going through. The special part is he gives us a choice in what to do in all things. But he renews us when we choose to follow him. When we choose to follow him, then God gets to work on us in his kindness. Now, I think it's interesting that this chapter actually starts with the answer. It says, think on these things and then works its way back through the equation. It's kind of like common core. Anybody else really love common core? I love it. It's just amazing. It's just a great... I'm just speaking life and positivity, okay? <laughs> Dealing with Common Core all the time with our kids. But there is a problem. But if we first think on these things, then we'll do what is good, what is heavenly, what is godly, planned and purposed for His glory in us. See, if we think on these things, we'll find ourselves doing what God's asked us to do, putting on the new self being renewed. It says, rid yourself. It says, just rid yourself of it. Let it go. It doesn't say you better work on that. It doesn't say you better work on that. It says, rid yourself of it. Can I, can I just reiterate the things that will, as we often say here, grow strangely dim, I want to read that portion again, that, that portion that we didn't like. But I want you to look at it from this perspective that says this, that if we focus on God, these things will grow strangely dim. These things will not have room in our lives. Treat the parts of your earthly body as dead to sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Rid yourselves of all of them. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you stripped off the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created it. The true knowledge of our being in his image is a crucial key here. We are being renewed to understand our image in him, our purpose and mission. And your image in him and your purpose and mission has nothing to do with those evil things, those things that don't lead to anything good. Admit it to yourselves right now. Nobody wants a life of anger and greed and obscene speech and slander. Nobody wants that. And if you're okay with doing that, I don't think you enjoy getting it in return, do you? None of us do. We'd much rather have kindness and gentleness and self-control and a little bit of patience, right? We'd much rather receive that. So why wouldn't we want to give it? I don't think any one of us want that life. And I happen to believe that the world around us results in a life of sins and trials because it's an escape. And if we have nowhere to go, no hope to find, then where are we going to go? We're going to go to addictions, we're going to go to escape mechanisms. No matter what it is, men have different ones than women. Some of us have the same. But if we have no hope, where are we going to go? The only way anyone is going to have any hope is if we show them who Jesus is and show them the mission. We are being renewed to understand our image in Him, our purpose and our mission. Let's continue. And here's the finish of this. So, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against one another, just as the Lord forgave you, which that's what we all hope for, so must you do also. In addition to all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ 
to which you are indeed called in one body. Rule in your hearts and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God, whatever you do in word or deed. And this is my favorite right here. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And there's other scripture that says, do all things as unto the Lord. So no matter what I'm doing, whether I'm working for a boss that I can't stand or whether somebody in my house is doing something that I don't like, I have to do all things as unto the Lord. I have to treat all as unto the Lord. It's not easy. But you know what it does? It creates character and it creates perseverance. And I guarantee you, any one of us, we meet somebody who's got good character and good perseverance and lives that life. We want to be around them, don't we? So imagine if you're that person and you say, hey, you know what? I want more of what God has. I guarantee you more people want to be around you. I guarantee you, you might be the first one up for that promotion. I guarantee you, you're going to be the one that people say, hey, I'd like you to come work for me. Because I know that you're honest. I know you're going to work hard. I know you got good character and good perseverance. I want those people around me. Don't you? How powerful those statements are. Maybe it's not common core after all. Uh, <laughs> now we talked about all those things pretty often. The fruit of the Spirit, the evidence of a Christ-centered life, the things that should be shown in our everyday lives. But I want to look at three words to break that down and make a mission with. Those three words are purpose, plans, and perseverance. I think we've all heard this statement, but to really grasp it, do we understand when God says that he knew you before you were in your mother's womb? That is no way we can understand that. No way we can understand that God knew who we were before we were even thought of. Conception, any of it. He knew you before you were in your mother's womb. But then again, this is the God of all creation. This is the God who put all this together. And we can't understand that either, right? We're still trying to figure out like, did he really do it in seven days? Or was it like, is that like symbols or literal? Like, I'm, I don't understand this. How'd he do this? <laughs> we don't understand it anyways. So understand that what he says is true. And what he says is that he knew you before you were in your mother's womb. And this is personal for me. Because my wife is 26 weeks pregnant. We're on number six, so obviously it's been personal for a long time, but we're, my wife is 26 weeks pregnant, and I love to feel him kick. I just love it. Whenever she's sitting, just relaxing, and you can see a little, mm -mm, I'm like, oh, I got to get there, and I'll push on him a little bit, give him a little push, you know, mess with him. But to think about that, and to think that that little boy already has a purpose, God knew him before any of this. That little boy has a purpose, a plan, and a God who will give him the strength to persevere. God had a plan for my family even before we were a family. And he had a plan for each and every one of you before in the same way. Now, I know that some of you might say, look, I don't have a family. I'm by myself. Maybe you've never been married. Maybe you've never had a family. Maybe you're just single and it's just you. Well, you have the family of God. I, I, know that that, I know that that doesn't cover all of it and I'm sure there's some things inside that still have to be dealt with because of all of it. But we are the family here. We are the family of God. We are called to love each other and to bear with one another. That's what it just said there in Colossians 3. How does that work? I don't know how God knew we were a family even before we were. I don't know how God had a plan for us even before we came to life. I'm still trying to put that together in my natural mind. And yet, before the foundations of this world, He knew each and every one of us. Could it be that part of the truth is the fact that his purpose and plans are similar, if not the same for all of us. We just have different gifts, talents, and ways about how to get it to work for us. You say, well, what if my way seems best? 
I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's probably plenty out there that would say like, hey, if everybody was like me, the world would be a better place. And you know, maybe there's some out there that that's a, that's a legitimate statement. I mean, there are some great people out there, some really godly people that do well, treat everyone well. And you think, man, if we all were like that, yeah, I don't see what the problem would be. But what if your way wouldn't work in my situation? Well, we have kind of the same situation, right? So it should. Well, not necessarily. How many know it doesn't work like that? I don't know if you've realized or recognized or taken it in that I don't, I try not to stand up here and just give advice. I try not to stand up here and just tell people what to do because I need advice sometimes. Sometimes I don't know what to do. So my whole goal here is to encourage you in what the scripture says, to encourage you in what God says, and then you get to make the decision to what works best for your family, your home, your job, your relationships. How do I translate that into my life? I love the statement, what would Jesus do? But I heard it just a couple years ago differently said, and that was, what would Jesus do if he were me? If he had my home, for me, if he had my wife, my kids, my job, what would he do if he were me? Because what would Jesus do? Well, he'd do everything perfect. He does everything just exactly the way it needs to be. He's without sin, without blemish, without fault. He's Jesus. He's God. He's going to do it perfectly. But what would he do if he was me? It starts to make a little bit more sense. How do I treat my wife if I want to act like Jesus? How do I treat my children if I want to act like Jesus? How do I treat my job, my occupation, my vocation? If I want to be like Jesus. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Yet they could only see Paul. Those people he was speaking to, they didn't know Jesus. They knew Paul. They didn't see Christ. They only saw Christ in Paul. I think that's our job. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. And those around us, they may not see Christ himself, but they'll see Christ in us. And they'll say, now I understand. Now I get it. So then maybe my gifts and talents and strengths and weaknesses have intricacies that are unique to me. And just maybe as I imitate Christ, I'll do it in a way that he has planned for me. Me, specifically. Without compromise of sin. Without compromise of the fruits without compromise of what's above. We're different, yes, absolutely, yet of one mind and one spirit. We're all part of the body with just different parts to play. The only thing that's irreplaceable in the body, and I think I shared this a while back, the only thing that's irreplaceable in the body is up here. And the Bible continually, continually refers to the mind of Christ, that Christ is the head, that God is the head. See, God is the only thing that can't be replaced. Any one of us, we can move into positions. God can move somebody else into a position if we're gone. We can cover any parts of the body, but we each have one. I might be a hand. You might be a foot. Some of you might be vital organs. I might be an ear. I don't know. But we all are a part of the body. The only thing that cannot be replaced is the head. And that's God. That's Christ. Jesus is, God is, his Holy Spirit is. God's word says we're all created equal in God's eyes. See, if you don't mind, I share this with you. Division, separation, upper, middle, lower classes, racism, you name it, all man-made, not God-made at all. Not God's purpose at all. Acts 10, 34. Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. James 2, 9 says, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as violators. Galatians 3, 28 says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. 
Do you know who fought to abolish slavery? A follower of Christ. Do you know who fought for equality? A follower of Christ. Do you know who fought for women's rights? A follower of Christ. Knowing who you're called to be brings clarity to what you ought to do. We try to find the answers to so much around us when we have it. And I just happen to have it with the Jesus book, the Pigeon Bible. But we have it with us. We have the answer. We are the answer. We always have been. The enemy would like to say no. The enemy would like to say the church is filled with hate. But remember when I shared with you, I don't believe the church is under attack. I don't believe that Christians are under attack. I believe it's God's goodness that's under attack because the world doesn't think he's good and we're the only ones who can show them. So when I say we're on a mission, we're on a mission to show the goodness of God because it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. Purpose. Whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. Plans, rid yourself of what's not of him and put on what is and perseverance. Keep your focus on heaven and on him. Run the race. Do not grow weary in doing good. For in season, you will reap the harvest. All promises of God. If we focus on the problems, we will not focus on the promises. I think we need to ask this week, What's your family most known for? Is it God's purposes or your preferences? And if you don't have a family, then you're going to have to look deep inside yourself. And if you look for somebody to be accountable, come to me. I'll join you. I'll join you in this, in this mission. If it's just you and you got nobody else, you don't have anybody you can trust, come to me. Tell me, hey, I need an accountability partner. I need to make a mission. I'll do the mission with you if that's okay. We're going to give you some tools today. When you leave, there's a paper bag out there with some stuff in there. It's got a family mission statement. There's some things in there that you can build on your own with your family. I'm going to do it. I commit to you that I'm going to do it. And I hope you'll do the same. Some things you can think of is write down what you think about most. Write down what belongs and what doesn't. Write down what you can do that reflects God's mission and the great commission. But these little worksheets that we have in there, all our campuses are doing them today. They have a lot of great questions and a lot of great little boxes you can break apart and say, okay, these are the questions I want to ask. These are the things I want to approach. That's what you can do in your personal life with your family and your home. But here's what we're going to do as a church. That map back there, it's been on my heart for a little while. Since we started here, I wanted to do a prayer initiative. I didn't know what it would look like until some of the people started coming along that God sent our way. And then we talked about doing adopt a block, praying for our neighborhoods, praying for our street, whatever it is. And finally, we're ready to release and go. And you know what the funny thing is in the middle of all this? I'm getting calls now and texts and questions from people because there's other initiatives happening in other cities, in other places. And people are wondering, what are you doing? What's going on over there? We had bridge builders with us a couple weeks ago on a Wednesday night because they heard about through our friends what we're doing and they said, we want to come pray with you. Before you launch all this, before you get all this going, we want to come pray with you. We want to come pray with you and agree with you that God's going to move. So what we're going to do back there, you can sign up in the back. Doreen will be back there to get you signed up. You could put your street name alone or you can put a few streets or wherever you want to walk, run, Walk the dog, take the golf cart, take your bike, take the, take the car, whatever it is, as long as you're praying, sign up in the back. We'll put your mark on the map. Get one kit per family because I think we, I don't know how many we have left, but we had about 40 this morning. So uh, we have a little fanny pack there. With, some of you don't care about a fanny pack anyhow, all right? So we got fanny packs back there for, for uh, one per family. There's a little journal in there and some special stuff that we got for you. Um, and we ask that you would just do at least one day per week, at least one day per week commit to pray for your street. If you pray for more, that's great. But just one day a week, pray for your street. And Doreen's email is in a letter that we have in there. And please let us know when God does something special or just tell us, come up and tell us, fill out one of those because of South Hills cards or whatever. Just tell us when God does something great. We've been hearing some incredible testimonies as of lately. We have a few that are already out there walking right now and praying. And God's doing some amazing things. So, 
for your family. We have mission kits out there. Grab them on your way back. If you want to be a part of what we're doing in this prayer initiative, grab a kit. Put your mark, we'll put your mark on the map, and we're going to see God change. I know right now it's just Manhattan Beach. We're going to pray for the whole South Bay. So if you live in Redondo or Hermosa or Torrance or uh, El Segundo, Hawthorne, Lawndale, no matter where you live, anywhere in the area, just put your name on the list. Write down where you live and where you're going to be praying. If it's not on that map, we will get a map and we'll put it on there. We're going to be praying for the entire South Bay, but we feel that God has called us right here in the middle of Manhattan Beach, so we're going to start here, and we're going to spread from there. So we got kits for you in the back, for your family, and we got those for those who are ready to pray with us. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, I just, I'm amazed at what you're doing. Thank you for everything you're doing in our families, in our homes, in each, each one of us, Lord. I know there's some in here that say, I, I, don't, I don't feel God. I don't feel like He's doing much. I'm struggling and struggling and struggling, and I really am asking God to do something. And Lord, we pray right now that you would show yourself mighty and strong in each and every life here, Lord. Show yourself real. Prove yourself to us, God, through your goodness, through your kindness. Show us what it means that when we follow you, we see lives around us changed. We see our relationships strengthened. We see hope, not fear. Lord, I pray for every home represented, every family and every single person, Lord. I pray that you give us strength in this time. I pray that you give us wisdom in this time. I pray that you help us stay committed to having a plan and having a mission, and that is to follow you, Lord. I pray you bless them all, Lord. All of them, every plan, every mission, everything written down, Lord, for the glory of you in us. I also pray for those in here that may not know you, may not have experienced your goodness yet. Well, Lord, I pray that this would be the place of safety, security, a strong tower, a lighthouse, a hospital to the hurting, a home for the homeless. Lord, let us be the church that you yourself said, the bride that you yourself said, that's who I'm coming back for. Lord, bless each and every person here, God. But most of all, I pray that you're blessed by all we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.